All right, today we are going to begin talking about complex power. This um, should be a review for what we covered in Engineering 221. So, complex power. All right, so complex power is really a construct that was developed by electrical engineers to aid in their analysis um, for the reasons that we've talked about previously, right? Dealing with purely instantaneous power signals carries a lot of information that doesn't really tell us uh, pertinent things that we need to know about our particular load. So we've developed what is effectively a shorthand notation for making power calculations. Uh, that are based specifically uh, on using the effective value representation of voltages and currents. Okay. So in the frequency domain, let's say that we had a generic impedance Z. Like so, over which we have a phasor voltage V and through which we have a phasor current I. In the frequency domain, our phasor voltage V is comprised of the magnitude of our time domain voltage and the phase angle of our time domain voltage. And similarly, our phasor current I is made up of the magnitude of our time domain current and the phase angle, excuse me, theta i here, of our time domain current. So this is our frequency domain representation. What we are now going to do is introduce an RMS phasor domain representation that utilizes effective values. Okay, and a conversion here is very straightforward. So in the RMS phasor domain, we're going to represent our voltage quantity as a phasor V, but instead of putting a bar over, I'm going to put a tilde over it to represent that we are in the RMS domain. And I'm going to represent my currents in the same way. RMS phasor voltage V is simply phasor voltage V divided by the square root of two. And RMS phasor current I is simply phasor current I over the square root of two. Um, where square, uh, excuse me, that division by the square root of two is simply taking that sinusoidal representation and treating it as an effective value because we learned in last class that the effective value of any sinusoidal function is simply its magnitude over the square root of two. And so from this, we get an effective value for the voltage with a phase angle of theta V. Okay? So the phase angle does not change when we go from the frequency domain to the RMS phasor domain. And similarly for our current, we will have a magnitude of I effective and a phase angle of theta I. And all of this constitutes the RMS phasor domain representation of voltages and current. We do not have to use any special representation for impedances because impedance inherently is the ratio of voltage to current. And so in the RMS phasor domain, we have the exact same ratio established as we would have in the frequency domain. So all of our impedances will stay exactly the same. Really the only thing that's going to change here is the magnitude of our phasers. We're going to go from the phaser, uh, the frequency domain representation to the RMS phaser domain representation by dividing by a 
factor of one over, or excuse me, dividing by a factor of square root of two. All right, so complex power, our mathematical definition. So S is our variable that we're going to use to represent complex power. And this is equal to RMS phasor voltage V times the complex conjugate of RMS phasor current. So let's talk very briefly here about the units of complex power. Um, we have the product effectively of voltage and current. So inherently, we would think the units here should be watts, right? Um, to avoid confusion, electrical engineers have actually created a new unit specifically for measuring complex power. And that unit is the volt ampere, okay? Where a volt ampere is dimensionally the exact same thing as a watt. But when you're talking about a quantity of power measured in volt amperes, that lets the engineer you're talking to know that you're dealing with a complex power quantity, okay? So we have units of volt amperes. Since RMS phasor voltage V and the complex conjugate of RMS phasor current I are inherently complex numbers, the product of those two complex numbers will also be a complex number. So we can express our complex power S either in a rectangular form or a polar form. So let's start with the rectangular form. Okay. So in rectangular form, this is going to look like V effective, I effective, cosine theta V minus theta I plus J V effective, I effective, sine theta V minus theta I. Where this part right here represents the real part of the complex power S. And this part over here represents the imaginary part of the complex power S. We call the real part of our complex power the average power. So this can be written simply as capital P or, and so I'm going to put it in parentheses, you might see this listed as P average. Okay? Where average power will have units of watts. Now, before we go on and talk too much, uh, before we move on and talk to, about the imaginary part of the complex power, I want to demonstrate something to you guys um, that is interesting. Okay. So, the effective, the magnitude of our RMS phasor voltage is simply Vm, the magnitude of our phasor voltage divided by the square root of two. I effective is then simply I am divided by the square root of two. So I'm gonna do this up here in green. So we'd have VM over square root of two 
times I am over square root of two cosine theta V minus theta I. Well, that's literally just one half VM I am cosine theta V minus theta I, the average power that we've been dealing with this entire time. Okay. So the average power in the complex or the RMS phaser domain is literally the average power that we've been dealing with at this point. That's where it came from. Okay. Complex power actually comes from here, recognizing that this is the real part of some complex quantity, not the other way around. All the other develop, uh, relationships were developed around that. Okay. So our average power is exactly the same as it has always been. What it represents is the portion of the complex power that is capable of performing mechanical work effectively. Okay. So we associate average power with resistance. Okay. So it's effectively the average power represents the portion of the power that gets absorbed by resistors. Over here with the imaginary bit, we call this the reactive power. And I guess actually, yeah, I'll write this down. Reactive power. That's huge. So that's the symbol that we give to the imaginary portion. Inherently, the units here are watts because we have voltage multiplied by current, but we call specifically the units of reactive power VARs, V-A-R, which stands for volt ampere reactive. The reactive power is associated with energy storage elements. So anytime we have a capacitor or an inductor, we are either supplying bars or absorbing bars. Okay. Um, this form of temporary energy storage is actually critical to the operation of our national electricity grid. Okay. Without temporary energy storage being supplied by capacitors and inductors, anytime we see a sudden increase in power demand, we would have a blackout if it were not for this contribution. Okay, so students often ask, you know, why do we even care about this if it's only representing what's going on for capacitors and inductors, which cannot inherently absorb any average power? It fixes the grid or stabilizes the grid. Okay. Uh, in our polar form representation, which I will do down here, we're going to have the product of V effective and I effective with an angle. theta V minus theta I. This product of V effective and I effective is what's called the apparent power. And I'm going to represent it as the magnitude of complex number S. I'm not going to give it a special symbol or anything. And the reason why I don't is because it is literally just the magnitude of our complex power. So I'm just using conventional complex number notation to represent the magnitude of a complex number. Okay. Since it is simply the magnitude of complex power, it has units of volt amperes as well. So effectively, if you say something absorbs 75 kVA, you're talking about apparent power. 
And if you say it absorbs 75 kVA with a phase angle of something, then you're talking about complex power explicitly. Okay. We're only dealing, uh, the, the magnitude portion obviously should not have a phase angle associated. And then the last part here, is what I'm going to call our power factor angle. Theta S. And what theta S represents is by how much the voltage across the load leads the current flowing through the load. Okay. So these are the different constituent parts of complex power. Okay. The real part we call average power having units of watts. The imaginary part we call reactive power having units of bars. Um, the magnitude of the complex power is the apparent power having units of volt amperes. And then the phase angle of the complex power is what's called the power factor angle, which has units of degrees or radians, depending on how you're measuring, because it's an angle. Okay. We have explicit mathematical formula here for all of these things, but it is not remotely necessary for us to actually remember literally any of them. Okay, and so what I mean by that is all of these pieces of information are buried inside that simple multiplication of two complex numbers, right? So your calculator, if you are physically capable of typing in your RMS voltage and the complex conjugate of your RMS current, and you tell your calculator to give you the result of that mathematical operation in rectangular form, you inherently have the average power and the reactive power. If you plug these two numbers into your calculator and tell it to give you the answer in polar form, you inherently have the apparent power and the power factor angle. So, it's not going to hurt anything for you to memorize these four relationships, but your calculator literally gives you all of those things already. Okay. Another handy dandy way to look at them is what's called a power triangle. So the power triangle is formed by simply plotting our complex power S on a complex plane. All right. So if we have complex power S, and I'm going to use black because that's what I represented it with before. So here is complex power S. The projection of S onto the real axis is our average power. The projection of S onto the imaginary axis is our reactive power. The length of this vector is our apparent power. 
and the angle that this vector creates with respect to the horizontal axis, positive horizontal axis, is our power factor angle. So this triangle also contains all of that information using basic trig identities, right? So if we know what S is, S cosine theta gives us the average power, S sine theta gives us the reactive power, the magnitude of S is our parent power, and theta is our power factor angle. All of those exact same relationships are buried inside this graph as well. Okay. So this power triangle is another handy way to remember what all the parts are. Okay. Just burying all that mathematical information into a simple and single graphical representation. All right. So we're going to circle back around to the power triangle in just a moment to be able to infer some other information from it. But before we do that, I want to introduce the concept of power factor, right? So the power factor angle has something to do with a quantity called the power factor. Power factor is defined to be the ratio of the average power divided by the apparent power. It represents a measure of the efficiency of power transmission in your system. Okay. Power factor can range anywhere from positive one, which means that all of the power that you're delivering to your load is real, all the way down to negative one, which means effectively the same thing, but you're supplying power now. So effectively, if, if your power factor is one, all of your absorbed power is real. If your power factor is negative one, all of your supplied power Anything beyond uh, between those two points represents some sort of inefficiency in your transmission. Okay, a power factor of zero means that none of the power that you are supplying, so none of your apparent power, is being absorbed as average power. Okay? So power factors of positive one and negative one occur in purely resistive systems. Power factors of zero occur in purely inductive or purely capacitive systems. And then everything in between those breakpoints means that you have some combination of resistance and capacitance or resistance and inductance, okay? Um, and I'll literally write that out for you in just a moment. Another way to represent the power factor, since it is simply the ratio of average power divided by apparent power, this is nothing more than cosine theta s, right? So if we take this relationship right here, which is our average power, and we divide by the effective times i effective, all we're left is the cosine function. That's our power factor. All right. so. For a power factor of one, all apparent power is absorbed as average power. I guess I should put it that way. For a power factor of zero, 
no apparent power. is absorbed average power. And for a power factor of negative one, all apparent power is supplied average power. If our power factor is between these limits, so if zero is less than our power factor is less than one, we have positive P average and positive Q. So some portion of our apparent power is being absorbed as a reactive power. And for zero is greater than, PF is greater than negative one, we have negative average power or supplied average power and absorbed reactive power. All right, so the magnitude of the power factor tells us a lot about what's going on with regards to how things are behaving, but it's not the entire picture, okay? So power factor is defined by two distinct properties. It's magnitude, which we've detailed here, and then whether or not the power factor is leading or lagging, okay? Leading power factors occur when Sorry, that should be theta s. Is less than zero. So whenever theta s is negative, we have a leading power factor. And lagging power factors occur whenever theta s is positive. Now, I want to clarify something here. The boundaries on these are effectively stop at plus and minus 180 degrees. Okay. Um, so, we, when we're calculating a power factor, we always want to use the minimum angle magnitude, right? So, 270 degrees isn't particularly helpful because that's beyond 180. Okay. So, <clears throat> we constrain leading power factors to be between zero degrees and positive 180 degrees, lagging power factors occur, uh, excuse me, uh, leading power factors occur when the angle is negative, so that's between zero and negative 180. Lagging power factors occur when the angle is positive, and so that's between zero and positive one. So, we can now look back at our power triangle and see pretty clearly then that the power tri uh, triangle not only tells us what our power factor angle is, but it tells us inherently whether or not we're operating at a leading or lagging power factor, depending on whether our angle is up here, which would correspond with the leading power factor, or below the horizontal axis, which would correspond to, well, excuse me, I got that backwards. Above the horizontal axis should be a lagging power factor, below the horizontal axis corresponds to a leading power factor. Another thing that we can infer from our power triangle is whether or not our load is a capacitive load or an inductive load, okay? Theta S by definition is theta V minus theta I. Well, theta V minus theta I, if you recall from a few lectures back, is also how we represent the phase angle of impedance, okay? 
So the phase angle of complex power and the phase angle of impedance are literally the same thing. So if theta s, actually let's say if zero degrees is less than theta s is less than 180 degrees, we can say that our power factor is lagging. And we can say that our load is inductive. If zero degrees is greater than theta s is greater than negative 180 degrees, we can say that our power factor is leading and that our load is capacitive. So we can really get a whole heck of a lot of information just from eyeballing this graph, right? We can get our average power, apparent power, reactive power, power factor angle, know whether or not the power factor is leading or lagging, know whether or not our load is generally inductive or generally capacitive. That's a whole lot of information buried in this one little track. Okay. All right, so all of this, or at least I believe the overwhelming majority of this should be review whether or not you had me for circuits one or somebody else. Uh, something that may not have been discussed if you had a, a different instructor for circuits one would have been alternative relationships that we can develop, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Does anything that we've covered to this point in the class need further review or explanation? Everybody, Bradley. Um, I wanted to ask what we're finding for students. projection the speed. So do we multiply um, magnitude of S by cosine theta S? Yes, we, magnitude of S times cosine theta S gives us P. Magnitude of S times sine theta S gives us P. You're absolutely right. Yep. And that is exactly what's detailed up here. V effective times I effective is the magnitude of S times the sine of theta S gives us reactive power. The magnitude of S times the cosine of theta S gives us average power. So yes. Any other questions on this? All righty. So our alternative relationships. So these alternative relationships really are just a manipulation of Ohm's law in the RMS frequency domain. Okay. Uh, and so what I mean by that is that in the phasor domain, we found that V is equal to I times Z. Everybody okay with that? So it stands to reason that since RMS phasor voltage V is just complex or phasor V divided by the square root of two and RMS phasor current I is just phasor current I divided by the square root of two, that Ohm's law should still just be V is equal to I times Z in the RMS phasor domain. Because we're scaling both sides of the equation by that same factor of one over square root of two. Okay. So in turn, 
I could say then that I is simply V over Z. And from this, I can rewrite my complex power relationship as S is equal to V times the complex conjugate of I, which is the same as I times Z times the complex conjugate of I. Well, what's I times the complex conjugate of I given? Anybody remember that from our manipulation of complex numbers? Disagree. It's not the magnitude, but it's very close. It's a magnitude squared. Okay. So this is the magnitude of our RMS phasor current squared. For those of you who don't remember the, the complex uh, number multiplied by its complex conjugate, I'll take care of that downstairs or uh, downstream here real quick. So if we have a complex number A that is represented as either A plus JB or the magnitude of A with a phase angle theta A, a conjugate is simply A minus JB or the magnitude of A angle negative theta, right? So A conjugate times A is A squared minus JAB um, minus J squared, which is the same thing as plus one. So plus D squared. Or it can be written as the magnitude of A e to the J theta A uh, sorry magnitude of A e to the J theta A like so which is just the magnitude of A quantity squared. Well A squared plus B squared is also the magnitude of vector A squared because that's just the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. Anywho, just proving to you all very quickly that this complex number I multiplied by its complex conjugate will return simply the magnitude of I quantity squared. So that we can determine the complex power absorbed by a particular um, impedance Z only knowing what the RMS phasor current is. And we can break this down into constituent parts as well. Okay. Um, so what I mean by that is we could treat Z as a rectangular form complex number composed of some resistance and some reactants, which would allow us to write the magnitude of our RMS phasor current squared times R plus J times the magnitude of our RMS phasor current squared times X. So we can see effectively what our resistive losses are or our reactive losses are. We could also develop the relationship 
that we're going to have phaser voltage, or excuse me, phaser RMS voltage V times V over Z. And we need to conjugate the whole thing here. Right? That's just V times I conjugate. Now, when I conjugate a fraction, I'm conjugating the numerator and I'm conjugating the denominator. Okay. So I will have V times V conjugate, which we know to be the magnitude of V quantity squared. And then in my denominator, I will have the complex conjugate of my impedance. which I can write as the magnitude of my voltage squared times R over the magnitude of my impedance squared plus J, the magnitude of my voltage squared times X over the magnitude my impedance. So these are alternative relationships. I typically speaking stop at these two and don't particularly worry about expanding it out, but there are times where these can make things more simple depending if you only want to know what the average power or the reactive power portion is. So these guys right here, I utilize an awful lot uh, because they allow me to calculate complex power only knowing either the voltage or the current flowing through the element or combination of elements that I'm interested in. Okay. So a few more things here just really quickly. Let's say that we have are interested only in the complex power that is absorbed by a resistor. Okay. So what's the impedance of a resistor again? Exactly right. Simply just the resistance value. So mm -hmm. if I look at this representation, I would have the magnitude of the current squared times R. And if I looked at my voltage only quantity, this would simply be the magnitude of the voltage squared divided by R. So effectively, for a resistor, we can just use our simple DC power relationships and we have the answer that we're looking for. Right? From this, we can also see that resistors absorb only average power, right? There is no imaginary contribution to the complex power. Or an inductor What do we have? So what's the impedance of an inductor? J omega L. Okay. So that means the complex power absorbed by an inductor will just be the magnitude of the current squared times J omega L. If we look at our first representation, so J omega L times the magnitude of I squared or J times the magnitude of V squared over 
omega L. And so we can see that inductors absorb reactor time, right? Because we have a purely real complex, or excuse me, a purely imaginary complex power that is always going to be a positive number. So inductors only absorb reactive power. And lastly, for a capacitor, this would look like negative J times the magnitude of the current over omega C or negative J omega C times the magnitude of the voltage squared. So we can see that capacitors apply reactive power because they have a purely imaginary complex power that will always be negative. So resistors absorb average power, inductors absorb reactive power, capacitors supply reactive power. All right, so we have two different options here. Um, the first option is that we can start working some problems with this stuff, and then we talk about power factor correction on Friday, and then work problems associated with that on Friday as well. The other option is that we develop the theoretical relationships for power factor correction today, and then we devote Friday entirely to working problems. That would be my personal preference, but I'm open to doing it either way. Which would you guys prefer? So today, theory, Friday, problems. Okay, sounds great to me. All right, so let me cycle ahead four pages in my notes. Yeah, seems reasonable to me. Why I bought, uh, brought both sets of notes. All right. So for these next several minutes, we are going to talk about the concept of power factor correction. You are going to have to listen to me talk for about three minutes before we get to any math. Oh, no. So as we talked about previously, power factor is a measure of the efficiency of power transmission, okay? Um, its value can range anywhere from one to negative one. Typically speaking, um, electric utilities want the magnitude of the power factor to be above about 95%, okay? So, Let's explain exactly why that is here. So power factor is defined to be the ratio of the average power to the apparent power, right? Average power is what consumers pay for. Apparent power is what utilities generate. So if that ratio isn't very close to one, the utility is paying money to generate power that isn't actually being used. So that's why they want it to be as close to one as possible. It will never be exactly one unless everything that was connected to the distribution was a purely resistive one. Okay. Also, power won't go down into distribution. So that's actually pretty interesting. Um, because there's a region in Texas to where they had distribution set up for a large number of residences, as well as an aluminum refinery. And when the aluminum refinery went out of business, the cost of power actually went up in that region. And the reason for that is because they had to pay for the infrastructure that was there 
for the aluminum refinery. The utilities didn't go back down until a bunch of Bitcoin miners moved into the area where they already had infrastructure in place to deliver power to them and brought things back down. So that's that's a lot of what this power factor correction is all about, okay? So if I have to generate, let's say, a thousand volt amperes of power, but you're only consuming 10 volt amperes of power, I still have to have wires and all that kind of stuff in place to be able to send that electricity to you, despite the fact that you're effectively going to be sending 99% of it straight back to me, okay? So the more current that you're sending down a line, like literally the larger the magnitude of current you're sending down a transmission line means the larger wire you need to have to send that electricity safely. So quantity called the ampacity of a wire. It's related to not only the material of the wire and the size of the wire, but also the insulation that's protecting the conductor and, and all that kind of good stuff as well, okay? So effectively, if the apparent power is very high, that means you're gonna have to be able to send larger amounts of current than if the apparent power was low, which requires literally more copper to do so, which is more expensive, okay? If your power factor is high, you'll find that the amount of current actually goes down. And we'll do that mathematically in a little bit. So uh, for a fixed amount of voltage, if your apparent power and your average power are out of whack, you're effectively sending a lot of current downstream and then having most of it return to you. Whereas if your average power and your apparent power are similar, almost all of the current you send downstream gets converted into mechanical energy. So you don't have to worry about it coming both back both ways and you get to use smaller rated conductors. Okay. So for the average household consumer, your power factor is probably 99% or higher, okay? While we do have lots of induction motors and things like that in our homes, the overwhelming majority of the loads that we present to the grid are resistant, right? So inductive loads might be microwaves, washing machines, HVAC units. Um, a dryer obviously has a rotating part, so it has an induction motor, but it also has a heat strip on it, so it's actually much more resistive than it is inductive, so it represents more closer to a resistive load. Um, your computers and all that kind of stuff, they absolutely have fans and things like that on them. However, computers are wired to work purely from DC power, so they have a power supply that converts AC to DC, and then all of those fans and motors and stuff on your computer are actually DC, so that's all DC loads. All modern televisions are semiconductor-based devices, so they're all effectively DC loads. Um, so anyway, in a, in a home setting, the overwhelming majority of the power that we consume is average power, and so this isn't an issue. But for an industrial consumer where they are running lots of different inductive loads to control processes, um, so maybe running conveyor belts, things like that, large-scale fans, all that kind of good stuff, their power factor can be appreciably less. Um, like if we connected a fan by itself to an outlet here and measured the power factor, depending on the speed of the fan, we'd see it drop somewhere between 80% to 60% with the higher speed fan operating at 60% power factor and uh, the lower speed fan running at roughly 80% power factor. When we have lots and lots of those inductive loads, overall, the connection to the grid starts looking more and more inductive, causing our power factor to get lower, which means the utility has to spend money on infrastructure to be able to supply it, okay? So what has been done is there has been a means by which to increase the power factor of a load. And that's done effectively by putting capacitances in parallel with the transformer to make it appear as if it is a more, make it appear as if it has a higher power factor, okay? And the reason that works is because as we just saw, 
capacitors supply reactive power. So we are canceling out the absorbed reactive power of our induction motors by supplying reactive power using a capacitor. All right, so mathematically, what this process looks like is this. So let's say that I have a load which is absorbing some amount of complex power which I am going to call S old. The projection of that old complex power onto the real axis would give me P old and the projection of that complex power onto the imaginary axis would give me what I'm going to call Q old. And then this angle, theta old, is what tells me what my old power factor was. Okay. Now, if I put a capacitance in parallel with this load, then what's going to happen is effectively I can just add the vectors up to tail. We know that the complex power absorbed by a capacitor is negative and purely imaginary. So I'm just going to call this guy right here S cap. And my new complex power, S new, is represented by this gray vector, where we have a quantity Q nu representing the reactive power absorbed by the system after power factor correction, which is lower, right? So we are absorbing less reactive power, which in turn caused a decrease in my power factor angle, which has now been reduced to So when we add capacitance to our system, it lowers the amount of absorbed reactive power, which in turn lowers our power factor angle, which causes an increase in power factor. Okay. So the math behind this is as follows. Let's call S old. old plus JQ old. S new is P old plus JQ new. Right? So this is the complex power absorbed by our load prior to power factor correction. This is the complex power absorbed by our load after power factor correction. And the difference between those two quantities has got to be the complex power that our capacitor supplied, right? So we could say that S cap is S nu minus S old, which comes out to be J Q nu minus Q old, or simply J Q count. Now, one thing to note here, 
power factor correction process does not change the amount of power absorbed by the system. That is very, very much intentional. Another thing to note is that the quantity Q cap will inherently be a negative number. Okay. Because the capacitor's job is to supply reactive power to our system. Okay, so Q cap will always be a negative number. So this is the complex power that is absorbed by our capacitor in this system. And we can relate it to an actual capacitor value. I'm gonna scroll up here for just a moment. By using this equation, because this is the complex power absorbed by a capacitor, fundamentally. Okay. So if we equate this relationship to this relationship, what we find is that C, the value of the capacitor that's needed in a power factor correction scheme is given by negative Q cap over omega times the magnitude of the voltage applied across the capacitor squared. And we can actually express this in a expanded form that looks slightly more complicated, but is honestly easier to use because it relates directly to the old and new power factors that we're trying to hit. Okay? So this is a generic relationship where we have to know how much reactive power we need from our capacitor in order to apply it. More generally, we can express this as P old times the tangent of theta old minus the tangent of theta nu divided by omega times the magnitude of the RMS voltage across the capacitor. Where P old tangent theta old minus tangent theta nu is simply negative Q cap. I personally prefer this representation because I actually have to do less work. If I know what my old power factor is, and I know what my target power factor is, and I know how much the average power uh, absorbed by the system is, I, it tells me what size capacitor to use. I don't have to do any really thinking about it. So, all right, so that is enough out of me for today. So this is our last topic on this section of steady state sinusoidal circuit analysis. On Friday, we are going to spend an entire day just working example problems and all that kind of good stuff, trying to illustrate some of these things that I've talked about. Uh, on Monday, we are going to begin our brief discussion of filters. Um, and then on Tuesday, we're going to wrap filters up. We're only going to be talking about first and second order filters. Um, all right. So as far as your exam three material goes, this is where it stops. Okay. Um, so the material that we've covered since exam two and up to exam three has been overwhelmingly a review of what we covered in engineering 221. We've only added in a few new concepts, uh, particularly how to analyze multi-frequency circuits in the frequency domain. Um, and then we've talked about maximum average power transfer. Uh, and then we've also done instantaneous power and average power absorbed by multi-frequency circuits as well. Just those three small things are the only thing new that we didn't cover in 221. Um, for your in-class portion of your exam, 
expect it to be extraordinarily similar to the level of problems that you did back in circuit one, because this is so much overwhelmingly a repeat. Okay. For your take home portion of exam number three, expect that to be more in line with the homeworks that I've given you up to this point to where you're effectively going to have to use maybe nodal mesh and things like that to solve the system using complex numbers. Okay. The filter material that we're going to talk about is only going to be used for a design problem. Um, it does build off of our understanding of steady state sinusoidal circuit analysis, but it's going to seem like it's wildly unrelated. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of talk about that disconnect a little bit on Monday. But anyway, uh, class meeting next Monday and next Wednesday only related to a design problem. Not even going to give you a homework over it because you're going to go into that stuff in so much more detail in your later classes. I just want to get you introduced to the topic here. Um, okay, Bradley, you had something? Um, yes. 4.30 to 5.30 is always, I think, right? Something like that? Yeah. I also want to ask that so for for a transformer unless you're at an industrial site you're probably not actually going to see the capacitor bank because so like if we looked outside at our distribution poles around here you're probably not going to see a capacitor bank attached to them because there's no need for it right um, the capacitor banks that you see sometimes you'll see them directly attached to the capacitor and it's going to look like um, it'll be a set of three almost rectangular looking boxes connected to each of the three terminals off of your three phase transformer. That's how it would look for a small scale application for a large scale application. So if you needed really large capacitors because you have a very large manufacturing plant, you're gonna look like a building because it's huge. Like it would be half the size of this room kind of thing. Yeah, any of them. Yeah, uh, if you, is there still a sink manufacturing plant here in town? Does anybody know? A what? There used to be a plant that made sinks, like kitchen sinks and stuff here in town somewhere. Out on Donaldson Road or something like that? Anyway, they, they would have had a capacitor bank that you could possibly go look at, but I don't even know if they're still in operation. So, might see a capacitor bank on the utility pole for a washateria um, because they have so many washing machines and all that kind of stuff that would represent inductive loads. So you may see one there depending on how efficient their washing machines are and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you just need it for in places where loads are. So that's, uh, that's an interesting question that I've been asked before. Um, typically speaking, I talk about placing the capacitor bank on effectively in parallel with the terminals of the transformer so that everything downstream sees the benefit. But you could power factor correct individual loads and you would get the same effect. You would just use more capacitors to do it. But the, it's typically cheaper to do it at the transformer than it is to do it per load. So, anything else? Alrighty, I will see you guys on Friday for lots and lots of math.